and coordinating this event. So this lecture makes, uh, it's a part of one of our programmatic themes, which is on frontiers of globalization and governance. And the reason that the Baha'i Chair is interested in this is because it has peace in the title. And uh, it's really important for us to understand through scholarly works um, how the world uh, can become a better place and how conflicts can be resolved in uh, manners that are uh, more beneficial, especially to the people who are involved in the various conflicts. And what are the implications for future? What should we be thinking about as the uh, uh, governance and world order is changing? What are the, the you know, what's in the future that we need to be thinking about and considering? So uh, having said that, I'm really very pleased that we have with us today Dr. Cunningham, uh, I think whose presentation will offer a very deeper understanding uh, of local, national, and international social forces that are reshaping the world. So let me just tell you that she has examined identity uh, as a central issue in um, politics today. And uh, the push from different identity groups within states for increased self-determination and the different choices made by these groups can lead to either non-violent action or an increase in violent conflict, often with limited chances of success. Professor Cunningham's research cuts across issues such as self-determination, cessation and non-violence resistance, and helps us to understand the motivations of different actors and the tactics they use. This understanding can also help shape politics at the global level, as in internal civil wars have become the main source of conflict and the international interventions required to stem these have become increasingly complex. Professor Cunningham's work has recently been recognized by the International Studies Association. Um, and she's an emerging scholar, uh, which has been awarded at the International Security Studies section. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland, and you probably all know this, but I'm going to go over it for those who may not be familiar with her work. And she's also affiliated with the Center for, uh, for International Development and Conflict Management. Her primary research interests include self-determination, cessation, civil war, leadership in rebellion, and nonviolent resistance. She received her PhD from the University of California at San Diego in 2007 and has been a Fulbright Scholar and a senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. It is really a pleasure to have her here today, and the title of her talk is Cessation, Violence, and Nonviolence. Please welcome Dr. Cunningham. Thank you so much for that lovely uh, invitation. Now you get to watch me attempt to change the PowerPoint presentation, which is not a skill they teach you when you get a PhD, but I, no, I, there we go. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks so much for the chance to be here and to talk to you about my research. This is uh, my newest, most active research project right now and I am just delighted to talk about it, uh, as many academics are, delighted to talk about themselves and their own research. Uh, what I'm gonna share with you today is uh, not just one paper, not just one project, it's sort of a broader research agenda that I've been working on for the past five years, uh, and I think is coming to fruition at, at a really fortuitous time for my research agenda, not so much for our country. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that today. Let me start by uh, showing you a map. This was something that was featured in my first book project, which was on self-determination politics. Um, this is uh, a graphic that shows you the extent to which the world is populated with these um, non-state national groups. So groups that make claims to national self-determination, they feel they have a right to their own state or to political autonomy, uh, but they haven't achieved it as of yet. 
Just to give you a few uh, examples, here is the flag from the Kurdish nation. So I'm sure you all know the Kurds span the borders of multiple other states and have an active uh, and, and very violent at times uh, conflict for national self-determination. Here we have the flag of the Western Sahara population in Morocco, another group with very long-standing deep ties to a national identity, um, but that is not as of yet and probably never will be uh, its own independent state. So these are the politics uh, that I have been exploring in this project on nonviolent resistance. My earlier work centered much more on accommodation and civil war, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those things together today and why I've come to the point in this project of looking at nonviolent resistance uh, as opposed to these other, these other outcomes. One of the things I'm going to talk about today is uh, the extent to which these groups succeed. Uh, and, and efficacy is going to be the centerpiece of the research I present today. And I'm going to start by showing you a few pictures of what traditionally we've thought of as the outcomes of these disputes. Um, often we think of concessions such as this, the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. This is a picture of their local parliament. This was the result of a long-standing civil war, negotiations with the state. Where is that? Mindanao? Yep. Uh, and then you have uh, movements uh, like the Free Aceh movement, long-standing uh, conflict here. This is a relatively famous picture of women insurgents in, um, in the Aceh movement in Indonesia. So the first is in the Philippines. Mindanao is in the Philippines. Sorry. Uh, and then one of the most popular uh, in terms of well-known cases of mass nonviolence uh, was the East Timor mass nonviolent campaign that led to independence in East Timor. Um, that did, of course, follow a long-standing conflict, but it was one of the few mass nonviolent movements we see around these politics. Uh, much more commonly, uh, and I'm sure Kate will appreciate seeing some pictures from her home here, uh, we see rallies and conventional politics and lots of other kinds of behaviors that we could call nonviolent um, around these issues. So two examples here, uh, some photos from Catalonia and from Scotland, um, where you have high levels of mobilization even at this time for greater national self-determination. So there's a lot of politics going on with national self-determination. This is by no means a settled question in the international system. Um, even though state boundaries are, are fairly fixed and we do have a norm of not changing state boundaries, we still see secessions. So in 2005, South Sudan became its own state. And even having worked on this topic for the last 15 years uh, and written a book on self-determination politics, I still can't tell you why South Sudan has its own state and not one of these other groups. Right? There's no uh, norm or rules guiding the international community to deal with these kind of struggles. What that means is that we see lots of different kinds of political processes happening. And we do see the outbreak of violent conflict. We do see accommodation. And we do increasingly see the use of nonviolence, which is going to be the focus today. Let me start by talking a little bit about uh, the fragmentation of these movements. One of the reasons that I was drawn uh, to thinking about these politics of national self-determination was a dissatisfaction with the way uh, academia, political science in particular, and even the policy community treated uh, the idea of who are these groups and what do they want. Um, so the first big project I, work on, I worked on with respect to this um, examined the degree to which these movements are internally fragmented. And this is just a graphic here to show you uh, sort of the extent to which we see internal fragmentation. So for example, uh, if we think about uh, a group like, say, the Kurds in Turkey, um, most people would know the PKK right, as a central actor in the Kurdish dispute, um, but they may not know about the other organizations that operate on behalf of the Kurds and make claims uh, with respect to the Kurdish population in Turkey. Uh, this first study that I worked on revealed uh, a just large and, and uh, diverse extent to which these movements are actually internally divided. Uh, and I'm telling you this not only to talk about my previous research, as scholars do, uh, but because this forms the foundation of the work on nonviolence. Right? So uh, in beginning to think about whether or not movements like these national self-determination movements use nonviolence uh, and whether or not it works, I'm starting with this base understanding that these, these movements themselves are very diverse, not just in what they say, um, not just in what they do, but in the way that they organize politically. 
And that's going to form sort of the stepping stones for thinking about what kinds of tactics are used in these disputes uh, and whether or not they work. My own work uh, and a set of other scholars in the past 10 years have established the effects of fragmentation. These disputes tend to be um, harder to resolve. Uh, they tend to have a lot more civilian targeting. We see side switching in conflicts. Um, and a lot of this work has focused on the number of organizations. It's a very easy way to think about how complex a social movement is. Most of this work, myself included, my own work, has treated these organizations as similar. And so uh, scholars that work on rebellion tend to look just at rebel groups. Scholars that work on protest tend to look at the same kinds of events or actors. Um, my own work looking at fragmentation tended to treat organizations as similar even if they um, had different agendas. Let me give you just a quick example uh, of sort of why this matters and what made me think about this as a longer term research question. Uh, for example, if we look at the Catholics in Northern Ireland, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, Sinn Féin and the IRA, our provisional IRA, two organizations that played a big role in politics there. Do you allow a little Q&A for during the talk here? Okay. Uh, who can tell me the difference between Sinn Féin and provisional IRA or IRA without any scholarship, any investigation? What would you say is the difference between those two? Same, re same religion, same group, same population. Well, the IRA, which is the army of the political group. Yeah, so they, so they distinguish themselves between the types of tactics that they use. Um, the IRA is an interesting case because we can think about them as having varying degrees of connection to their political wing. Uh, we see even now um, long-term dissent within the larger movement. Um, but like a lot of these movements, um, they've sort of specialized, right? So you have political parties like Sinn Féin and you have military wings or organizations uh, that are defined in part by the tactics they use. Um, and this case stuck with me. They're not the only case where you have this military political wing. Um, this stuck with me because in, in our sort of broad look at fractionalization and the role that this diversity plays, um, these would be seen as linked um, but not distinct based on their strategies. So there was no real consideration of diversity of strategies uh, in this early work that looked at more complex non-state actors, complex rebel groups, or complex social movements. What this study does that I'm going to present to you today uh, is a step, one of the first steps, I think, in really addressing this strategy diversity at the organizational level. And I'm going to make an appeal to you at the end of the talk um, that we as a scholarly community uh, need to stop characterizing actors by what they do. We need to stop talking about necessarily rebel groups or nonviolent dissidents or terrorists, um, but that in fact uh, we can move well beyond this peace and war dichotomy, um, this violence and nonviolence dichotomy, although I did still put that in the title, uh, and think really broadly about how actors choose to engage uh, with the state. So we have this diversity of organizations, but not information on their strategies, um, by and large. Uh, and then around 2011, when I was working on this big project on fragmentation, uh, and I was spending a lot of time in Oslo at the Peace Research Institute, uh, I had a chance to talk with a bunch of scholars that were working on nonviolence. And we have this great book by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Steppen that comes out in 2011 uh, that says nonviolence works. They do a big global comparison of violent and nonviolent social movements. They look at civil wars and mass nonviolence, and they come to the conclusion uh, that nonviolent resistance works. This book got a lot of traction, continues to get a lot of traction uh, all around the world and in the US. Um, but the thing that puzzled me and that intrigued me is that it's basically not used and it doesn't work for the kind of politics that I'm interested in. Uh, by and large, self-determination movements, these groups that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, exist all over the world in relatively high numbers, don't use mass nonviolence. About 4% of them actually engage in this at any given time. Uh, and, and based on Chenoweth and Stefan's own study, it doesn't work for these kinds of political questions. Uh, this didn't really mesh with my understanding of what was happening with these politics. So having spent a number of years 
gathering information, and talking to people about political mobilization, talking to people in governments about how they respond. Um, for me to look at this data on mass nonviolence and say, self-determination struggles just don't use nonviolence um, didn't appear to be uh, correct at face value, should be taken at face value. Uh, and in fact, one of the big conclusions of this study that I'm going to show to you today uh, is just an empirical finding. Uh, Self-determination movements do tons of nonviolence. I'll show you a graph in a moment to look at the, the actual spread of this. Um, here's how I found that out. I started with all organizations and self-determination movements. This is from 1960 to 2005, so 45 year time period, looking at every organization that ever said, for example, we want Scottish autonomy, or we want not as much Scottish autonomy as that person that's Scottish next to me said, um, or we need more language rights for the Kurds. Um, every organization that made a claim on behalf of these individuals uh, within their group, and then through a, uh, a research grant through the Norwegian Research Council, uh, we collected data on violent and nonviolent tactics um, for over 12,000 observation years. So a large set of information on the kinds of things that these organizations are doing, uh, and including things like, and I'll give you more detailed information soon, um, sit-ins, self-immolation, economic boycotts, uh, but also things like whether they attack the state, whether they attack civilians, um, whether they attack their own population. What do I find? Just without pushing forward any theoretical argument, just asking the question, do they use nonviolence, right? Um, Chenna within Steppen's data suggests that it's super rare, uh, and for mass nonviolence it is, um, but I find a huge variety of tactics, a rich variation across these organizations and within movements. Uh, I find organizations switch amongst nonviolent tactics, so they use um, not just protests, but other types of nonviolence. Um, they switch between violent and nonviolent tactics. So our characterization of organizations as violent or nonviolent is often incorrect if we look at a broader time span. Uh, and we see mixing within movements. Right? So it's not that one group of people is wholly nonviolent or wholly violent. Um, in a lot of instances, we see the use of both. Just a simple graph to highlight to me what was the exciting uh, finding, just bringing together that data, that 45 years worth of information on behavior of organizations in these disputes, um, you can see nonviolence is by far the most popular strategy if we compare violence and nonviolence. Um, and this is really at odds with what we would think if we just looked at mass nonviolence. If you recall, we see about 4% of organizations or movements using mass nonviolence, uh, and here we see over 35%. This is organizations. If we look at movements more generally, say we look at the Kurdish movement in Turkey um, or uh, the Mindanao movement uh, in the Philippines, what we see is that 80%, about 80% use nonviolence. And again, contrast that with our, our thinking before this data. So what do we mean by nonviolence? Let me start with some examples close to home. I gave this uh, similar talk on this, this research project uh, the Tuesday after the Women's March in DC, uh, making it seem particularly uh, apt. Uh, we see, in some cases, mass mobilization. Um, so probably all of you know some people that participated in this march. Uh, just before that, we had this attempted self-immolation at President Trump's hotel in DC, another type and style of nonviolent action. Um, one of these requires a fair amount of people. One requires just some uh, incendiary uh, devices. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the news whatsoever, you'll know some information about the 2016 Standing Rock resistance where we had veterans coming in from all over the country to act as human shields uh, in the Standing Rock uh, resistance movement. Uh, and then we can think a little bit more broadly about these long-term movements. Um, all these just here in the U.S., things like the Occupy Wall Street movement, where you see people sleeping in tents for months on end trying to resist uh, economic policy. Um, some of these are, are sort of more spontaneous than others, right? If we think about nonviolent resistance, we can see uh, in some cases there are flashpoints of activity. Um, 
Many others are coordinated by existing organizations, right, or perpetrated by people who belong to organizations that are pushing for policy change. Uh, and this is largely what I'm going to focus on today, is the use of nonviolence by existing organizations. Let me take you to a little bit, uh, a little bit more distant example here. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the mural of Bobby Sands. Uh, Bobby Sands was an IRA member who was uh, imprisoned and died during a hunger strike. Um, he was one of a set of people that died during the hunger strike. This is the, uh, a picture of the, the headline for the World section in the New York Times uh, the day after he died. So you have reported in the United States, um, Sands dies in Northern Ireland jail on the 66th day of a hunger strike. Uh, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about why I'm showing you this link between uh, media coverage in the U.S. and something that's happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, but let me also highlight from this article what I think is a very interesting response. You have the U.S. State Department putting out an official statement saying that they deeply regretted the death of Sands. A person who's in prison in another country for engaging in terrorism. Right? This is relatively uncommon response from a State Department. And then because they're in New York, uh, and New Yorkers are like this, you have both the governor and the mayor of New York City coming out and condemning the British government uh, over this issue. So you have... Oh, well, there's a lot of Irish people. Oh, of course there are. <laughs> uh, so we see, um, I wouldn't say one man's act, here uh, centering on one man's death, right? Through a hunger strike, there were other hunger strike um, members, people who died. Uh, mobilizing this kind of response, right? Eliciting uh, sympathy uh, and condemnation. Okay. I'll return to that idea in a moment, this idea that nonviolence can elicit sympathy and condemnation across borders. Uh, but let me give you a, a little bit of information on uh, the different types of nonviolence that we're considering. Um, the existing work in political science is focused on mass resistance, uh, which typically looks like escalating and cascading protests. So it's in your square. Um, you see many, many people coming into the street, hundreds of thousands of individuals. We also have work on smaller scale protests. Um, we have work on things like election boycotts. But we have no studies that really bring together all these kinds of things that you can do. Um, so in this study, uh, in conjunction with scholars of nonviolent resistance, uh, we devised five categories of action that we were interested in. So one set of actions that we examine are economic non-cooperation. We also look at traditional protests, rallies, and demonstrations. If you're interested in participating in a rally or a demonstration, uh, you can find one just down the road here any given day of the week now. Um, we also see, and this is also happening in the U.S. right now, uh, nonviolent interventions. So things like sit-ins and occupations, people handcuffing themselves uh, across roads to buildings, trying to disrupt, but with small numbers of people. Uh, we also see instances of social non-cooperation, so things like hunger strikes, uh, self-immolation, other kinds of self-harm. And then finally, something that, that gets studied usually separately from nonviolence or protest, uh, we look at political non-cooperation. Um, so election boycotts, withdrawal from political office. Not the same as quitting because they found out you lied. Uh, I mean, purposeful withdrawal in order to oppose something. Uh, so we have, this, we have this diversity of strategies being used that we didn't know about before. Right? Before the study, Separatists, uh, secessionists, pro-self-determination groups and actors were largely characterized as violent. Um, what we find in just collecting this data is that there is extensive use of nonviolence. And one of the questions that, uh, that I wanted to ask with this project um, is whether or not it works. Right? This is, I think, the, um, the center point for looking at the work that uh, Chenoweth and Stepan had done and that others have done, Donardo's power and numbers, um, the set of works that do empirically assess whether or not nonviolence works um, all focus on ma mass nonviolence. So really asking the question uh, whether or under what conditions uh, this kinds of political behavior work. And again, fortuitous for my research agenda, this is a question that's being asked all the time right now in American media. Does nonviolence work? Right? Does, it, does it make sense for you to invest your time going downtown and joining these protests? Um, or does it make sense for you instead to call uh, your representatives or, or to engage in other kinds of behavior? 
Um, this is actually a, a somewhat difficult question to ask. Partly it's difficult to ask, and the reason that I think Chenoweth and Stepan don't address this very well in their big study of mass nonviolence is that secession, this ultimate outcome of these disputes, is very uncommon. Right? If we want to know if nonviolence works in self-determined disputes, asking whether or not it leads to secession is not a good question. Right? Secession is haphazard. Uh, it's difficult to understand when and how it happens anyway. Uh, and most organizations know that they're not going to get their own state. But what I argue in this project and in my first book demonstrate um, is that accommodation of these movements is not uncommon at all. Um, and in fact, governments do lots of positive things in response to mobilization over this issue. So I'm reframing this question about understanding efficacy. Okay? Instead of saying, does nonviolence or violence work? What I want to know is, is nonviolence or the use of nonviolence leading to something these groups want? Right? Are they getting some kind of concessions when they use nonviolence? There are lots of ways to think about success. Right? One would be secession. Uh, I'm going to argue that accommodation is a good way. We could think creatively about some other ones as well. Uh, I'm going to operationalize this in my study as a greater chance of accommodation. And I'm going to take a few minutes to explain to you what I mean by accommodation and why states would do it. When I started working on self-determination and on nationalist politics, uh, I was drawn to this idea that people would sort of live and die for this concept, right? That nationalism meant that much to people. Um, they, they formed militias, they joined armies, they would break apart their state. Um, and you would think that if nationalism and national identity was so important, um, that we would never see governments making concessions over this, over their fundamental identity. Um, but as I started to look at the politics of this, uh, I found, and I think it's, it's sort of sensible to think about it this way, um, that states actually aren't so harsh on this issue. We do have situations uh, like the French state, where it's constitutionally illegal to be of a different nationality. Right? So states do feel strongly about this, but they actually do lots to accommodate these groups um, besides letting them go. And that even happens sometimes. Um, so states accommodate these groups uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is to manage the challenges uh, of a multinational society. We know from a, a large body of political science research that multi-ethnic or multinational societies face unique challenges. One way to address this is to try to accommodate demands of these groups. Uh, another reason that states choose to accommodate is to lower the costs of dissent, I mean, um, to allow politics to run as usual and to recognize that people are different and have different preferences. Uh, and then finally, states hope often to avoid escalation. Right? So if you have uh, active demands for more self-determination uh, or agitation for autonomy, uh, states would like to avoid that turning into a secessionist war, uh, which as we know is sort of the number one cause now of civil conflict. The argument I make in this project is that movement strategies and tactics are going to impact this process, right? how states accommodate, how they think about accommodation. Concessions over these issues, uh, self-determination claims, uh, are relatively common. Let me tell you a few, a few examples and a few uh, pieces of information about this process. Um, we can look at sort of the actual content of accommodation. So you see uh, language recognition is a common one. Uh, again, when I first started to work on these politics, I thought, well, you know, you have secessionists, and they're very serious about what they want, right? And then you have people that want autonomy, and they really want less. Um, what I found in looking at all these different groups around the world is that people are willing to fight and die not just for independence, but for the right to speak their own language, right, or to name their children their own language. Um, so we see a lot of concessions about language. Uh, we see concessions related to fiscal policy, so the idea that people should be able to control their own economic futures. Um, we see a lot of reconstruction uh, of states as we think about internal political boundaries, uh, and I think. One of the more interesting things being in the United States, talking to people about this, is that we actually have a ton of internal secession movements in the United States. Uh, I'm a native Californian from Southern California, which if any of you are from California, you know is very different than Northern California. 
Uh, living in Maryland, I've learned that Western Maryland is actually quite different uh, from Eastern Maryland. Even within the United States, we have movements for uh, internal reorganization, and we see this happening in response to these kinds of claims, these national self-determination claims. Uh, I will say there, there was a push actually for California to secede altogether after the last election, but I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, so, so we see lots of examples of this. Um, all in all, there are over 200 instances of governments giving something to these groups, right? Uh, we can think about these as success. But, I mean, yes? But, but, but then there's sometimes when they re respond, governments respond with repression. Yes, great unless, point. Unless, unless you're going to call those negative concessions. Yeah, so I don't call I don't call repression negative concessions, but I do look extensively at repression uh, and the active civil war in, in the larger project. I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, so we, we could also think about it as losing <laughs> or sort of not being successful. Um, but actually, what I find is it's not just that governments uh, choose to accommodate or choose to repress. A lot of governments actually do both simultaneously. Um, so I think it's a relatively complex political question. Um, these accommodations uh, are pretty widespread. Let me give you a little bit of information about them. Uh, the point of telling you some of this information is to convince you that this is a meaningful way to look at efficacy, right? that accommodation is not something that's irrelevant. Uh, about a third of these movements get one concession. A third get more than one. Uh, about a third get zero. Uh, it happens in all regions of the world, so this is not just a phenomenon that happens in the West. Uh, it happens in all regime types. Democracies are more likely, on average, to give things to people uh, that make claims on the government, but they're not exclusive in doing so. Here's what I really want you to think about uh, what efficacy means. Um, about a third of these accommodations require legislative change. So it's not just that the government is looking at the opposition and saying, okay, fine, take something, right? We're just gonna buy you off. Uh, about a third is require legislative change. Uh, a fifth involve constitutional changes. So they're actually changing their constitution in response to these claims. Uh, and then a fifth of these occur during violent conflict, and we'll talk more uh, about violence. Um, one of the things that came out of my first project uh, was this real dichotomy between thinking about um, do we want to think about secessionists and secession conflict as different from all other self-determination politics? And I would argue no. Right? Most accommodation doesn't happen during civil war. So in particular, if you're interested in whether or not accommodation works, which I can talk more about if you want me to, um, you can't just look at these civil war cases. Uh, and we see the vast majority of concessions happen outside of that conflict. What is nonviolence doing here? What's the role that nonviolence is potentially playing in this story I'm telling you about how governments respond? I would argue that these movements in general and any particular organization uh, has a real challenge in gaining and maintaining legitimacy for their claims. We have a very state-centric international system. We have a norm of border fixity. Uh, we don't see a lot of support for secession by and large. Uh, and so this is somewhat of an uphill battle. And that the international context and response really matters. So of the few studies we have about why states get recognized as independent states, um, this is a study by Bridget Coggins, the finding is that it matters what the big important states think or what the most powerful states think. Uh, let me start by asking you guys just to give me a very, uh, a very slight comparison here uh, of two groups in China. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the Tibetans. We had the Dalai Lama here speaking on campus not that long ago. Uh, and some of you may have heard about the Uyghurs. Um, if you're following people's thinking or pop thinking or even media coverage of these groups, what you'll see is an association, say for example, between uh, the Tibetan struggle and human rights um, or activism. Right? You can drive around the United States and find free Tibet bumper stickers. You can go to a benefit concert uh, for Tibet. Uh, if you know who the Uyghurs are, what are they known for? Are there benefit concerts for the Uyghurs? No. If you know anything about the Uyghurs, you know that maybe they're terrorists, right? This is the media presentation, and this is largely what has been said uh, about the Uyghurs post 9-11, right? So you have two groups that have similar claims, 
um, but very different experiences in terms of international reputation. Um, now this study isn't a side-by-side -side comparison of Tibet and the Uyghurs. Um, these are just illustrations to show you that you can have these groups that have really different perspectives uh, held about them in the international community. Um, what these groups want to do, on average, groups may vary in this, um, if they're attracting attention is to attract positive attention. Right? Um, so, so this is something, I'll argue in a moment, that nonviolence can do. Um, what this can do, from a human rights perspective, is raise the cost of repression. So nonviolence facilitates this in two ways. Um, using nonviolence can, if successful, if you're able to maintain nonviolence or at least convince uh, people that this is your primary tactic, can kind of shield these movements from the terrorist label. This is something that governments do frequently um, all around the world is to say, we don't negotiate with terrorists. We're not interested in dealing with terrorists. So for the government to be able to look at your organization or your movement and say, these are terrorists, it absolves them from responsibility of actually dealing with your claims. Right? Whether or not those are legitimate claims, uh, they don't have to make that distinction right? because they can call you a terrorist. The second thing using nonviolence can do, and this is something that I'll get into a, a little bit more in the empirical analysis, um, is it allows these groups to frame their struggles as a human rights issue. And if you think about these types of groups that make claims for national self-determination, the things they have in common are uh, the shared history within their group, the foundations of their origin, um, these stories about their nation and their legitimacy in this world of nation states. That's one way to frame their struggle, right? We deserve this because we're a nation. Another way to frame their struggle is we are a nation, but we are a nation that has be, is being horribly oppressed. We're not allowed to speak our own language. We're not allowed to name our children in the language that we uh, grew up with. Um, we can't uh, take tests in our own language. Uh, the government abuses us. This is a different way of framing the struggle. Right? This is a human rights question. It's not about your rights as a community. Um, so these are things that nonviolence can help you do um, as, you, as you work towards framing your struggle for the international community. What's the international uh, community? Okay. I'll well, get to that. Because if yeah. I, I think of, of, of the United Nations General Assembly, yeah. I, mean, I mean, perhaps perhaps majority there are dictatorial regimes, and as far as they're concerned, presenting something as a human rights issue is, is a negative. This, this, I think, is, is actually, so this is a question uh, about what the, who is the international community of relevance. Um, this, I think, is, is somewhat of a difficult question and probably varies by group. So, for example, um, I was talking to a student of mine who comes from China, and he said, you know, if you're an organization operating in China, uh, making a call to and affiliating with in any way Western human rights is not necessarily going to help you. Right? Um, that goes to the repression question. Um, whether that varies by place, I'm going to look at some ways to look at that statistically to see what kinds of responses we're getting to this. That's a great question. Um, but the United Nations group on um, human rights yeah. was dominated by repressive countries. It's true. I mean, the membership okay. was basically repressive. We'll, we'll return to the United Nations momentarily. Um, so both of these things, this, uh, this trying to shield yourself from the terrorist label, um, framing your struggle as a human rights issue, uh, I would argue can make state repression more difficult and can increase incentives to accommodate rather than repress. And recall, most states do some of each. They accommodate and they repress. Right? It's not that they have a normative agenda with respect to never repressing and always accommodating uh, or vice versa. We see some, some relatively unpleasant regimes making accommodations. What I'm arguing for here is an alternative path for nonviolence. The Chenna Within Stepin book, um, the other work that we've seen on the efficacy of nonviolence, uh, the leverage of nonviolence largely comes from power in numbers, right? That you're getting a lot of people in the street in order to pressure the regime. And I think we're seeing a lot of uh, adherence to this belief today in the US, right? That, that there's continual attempt to mobilize more. My argument here is that nonviolence can work in a different way, right? Through framing, um, through 
thinking about sensitivity of states to international condemnation. Um, Nonviolence can, under some conditions, work to constrain, constrain the state, make accommodation more attractive. Right? So this is another path for nonviolence to increase the chances that you're going to succeed. Uh, and to differentiate this from other studies, so here the mechanism is really the nature of nonviolence. Right? It doesn't matter how many people you're mobilizing necessarily, um, but how you use nonviolent resistance or nonviolent actions. Uh, it also allows us to look at a whole set of nonviolent activities, not just mass campaigns with lots of people. I use a few, uh, a, a few ways of evaluating this. This is a, a study that's still in progress. So I look forward to hearing people's questions and comments about it. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm building on uh, a rich data set of organizations um, that make claims on behalf of self-termination movements. Um, and what I'm going to do is look at these movements over time. And what I want to do is um, use statistics. I'm going to use a logistic regression, and I'm happy to talk about all myriad of different kinds of, of testing that you can do for this. Um, and essentially say, given that movements differ in how nonviolent they are, the extent to which they're using nonviolence, um, are those that are using more nonviolence getting more? Uh, or, or is it the same? Or are they getting less? Um, there are a number of ways that we could think about this uh, conceptually and in terms of the data. I'll present to you some findings here today using the percent of organizations in the movement, um, but this is something that uh, I look at a number of alternatives, including uh, because I'm looking at this sort of more symbolic approach, um, whether any organizations use nonviolence. And I'm happy to talk at length about the statistical st tests. Um, what I do in this study is build on the work that I've done on this on accommodation and control for the things that we already know are likely to get these groups accommodated. So the kinds of states that are more likely to accommodate, the types of movements, the contexts in which they operate, uh, and then see, given all of that, given this rich picture that we already have of why states accommodate these minority groups, does nonviolence matter? Right? Does the strategy that they use matter and how? What I find, and I'll, and I'll talk and show you a few pictures about this, uh, is a three-fold increase in your chance of accommodation. If you compare a movement that uses no nonviolence, right, um, either strictly uses conventional politics uh, or uses violence, to a movement where all organizations use nonviolence, they're three times more likely to get accommodated or to be successful. Uh, that's not the most uh, useful comparison. Um, we can look at this by graphing the predicted probability of accommodation. Um, and this is essentially just a plot of the marginal effects of getting, uh, of the effect of nonviolence on accommodation. Uh, you can go from zero to one. The greater the percent of your movement that's using nonviolence, uh, the more likely you are to get accommodated. I'll answer questions at the, at the end at this point, if you don't mind. Um, what are we finding then? Greater nonviolence is associated with accommodation. Of course, this is a statistical relationship. Um, because I have information on the use of violence, I can explore not just nonviolent tactics, but also violence. Um, I don't find that violence leads to more accommodation. This is consistent with my earlier work that looked at civil wars, but it's a much more fine-grained look at violence. It, it, I can assess the percentage of the movement that actually engages in violence and what type. Um, if we disaggregate nonviolent strategies, right, looking at those five different types, uh, I find that the most robust indicator is nonviolent intervention. Right? If you recall, that's not a mass strategy. Right? This is among the more symbolic of strategies for attracting attention uh, and causing disruption. There's a fairly complex uh, set of arguments about whether and how the mix between violence and nonviolence could matter. Uh, I've done a number of things to try to address these. Uh, they're probably emerging in some of your minds now. Um, the, the sort of most common uh, response or question that I get when I talk about this project, well, is it the radical flank? Right? This is something that was talked about in the American Civil Rights Movement, that you need someone to be willing to use violence because that's going to um, both galvanize people, but also get the government to look at you and say, well, you're the moderates, right? Uh, we're worried about escalation, and you're the moderates that are using nonviolence. Um, I don't find evidence for that kind of political dynamic in, in these self-determination movements. 
Um, and I look at the effect of, uh, of whether nonviolence holds, whether we see this robust relationship um, in a whole bunch of different scenarios, how diverse the demands are, whether there's a mixed strategy, if there are a lot of movements in the country, um, whether the group is excluded at the center, uh, and find a persistent robust relationship between nonviolence and accommodation. I also try to do a number of creative things um, to address this issue of uh, heterogeneity within movements, not just of organizations, not just of strategies, but of how important these organizations are. Right? Um, so if you're a case expert, you could probably look at a movement and say, well, sure, these three are using nonviolence, but the one that matters is not, right? The, the long-standing organization that has the uh, allegiance of the people so to speak. Um, so I, I do a number of things to try to look at, uh, at, at that dynamic. I look for the duration of organizations in particular. Um, I don't find um, this to be the case, that these long-standing organizations are more or less important than any others. Um, and then I try to do, I'll, I'll present a few, uh, a few other things that I've done. Um, which are not, this says further analysis, makes it sound superfluous. Um, th these are sort of not superfluous uh, tests. So the argument that I make is that uh, nonviolence plays this alternative role. Right? It's another path that you can think about uh, nonviolence working when you have a lot of people pressuring the state, but you can also think about it playing a role in altering the incentives of states to behave in different ways. Um, and we know, so for example, I'll return to this. Uh, return to this example I gave you early on about um, you know, the governor of New York right, and the US State Department responding to nonviolence and pressuring the British government. Um, we know from the human rights literature uh, that some states are more susceptible than others to this kind of pressure. Um, there's not a great deal of work on this from what I can find. There are three kinds of states that we think are more vulnerable to pressure over human rights issues. These are small states, transitional states, and economically dependent states. Um, and what I've done then is to take this study um, looking at movement's use of nonviolence and ask, uh, is that success conditional on it being a susceptible state or a sensitive state? Um, what I do find is not all, but some of these are meaningful. Um, nonviolence appears to be more effective in politically unstable states. So states where governments are in, tr in transition, they're less well established, um, nonviolence has a bigger effect on accommodation. I also do a set of things uh, to, to sort of poke at some of the theoretical connections that I'm arguing for here. And someone brought up the, the UN question. And so one of the arguments I make is that nonviolence could be drawing this attention, right, and, and subsequently pressure. Uh, or it could not be, right? The international community could be completely ignoring these people. Uh, you know, the Irish in New York might have had this fluke response, right, that, that we've got this because we have ties, uh, historic ties to Ireland. Uh, so I asked a secondary question, do these movements get more international attention uh, or pressure? There's lots of ways to conceptualize this, most of which I could never get great data on. Um, but there is new data on UN resolutions about these disputes. Uh, what we find is in this time period that I'm looking at, there are 185 instances of the UN passing a resolution about these conflicts, trying to pressure these states. Um, and this allows me to just do a little bit of work probing this mechanism uh, and see if I'm, if I'm right or if, I can, if I'm supporting my argument. What I should find and what I do find is that nonviolence increases the chance of a UN resolution. Right? So if we look at just the a comparison between movements that are using nonviolence, movements that are not using nonviolence, uh, again, there's about a threefold increase in the chance of a resolution. Um, so this really probes this mechanism of state pressure, right, or pressure on the government. Three said that already. The other thing I do in this project, and I'll stop talking about statistics soon, which I know is not everybody's favorite thing to hear about, uh, is try to address this question of a non-random assignment of nonviolence. Uh, so a smart question in response to this talk is, well, you know, some use nonviolence, some don't. That's probably not exogenous. Right? We're not defining that from the outside or randomly assigning it. Um, so again, I try to use statistics to address this issue. Uh, I use a treatment effects model uh, and look at movements where a majority of organizations use nonviolence and a majority uh, and ones that don't, uh, and use the statistical modeling to try to uh, address this issue. 
Um, what I'm finding is this higher mean predicted probability of accommodation. So this is a statistical way to address these endogeneity and non-random assignment issues. Uh, there are other ways to think about testing and evaluating this argument. Um, one that I'm currently engaged in is an experiment on framing and legitimacy. So taking this theory about how the international community responds to these different kinds of groups and finding out if we can do it in a controlled environment that we find that. Right? If we can't in a controlled environment find these kinds of responses, um, then that would suggest that there are some, there's some issues with the mechanism. Uh, I can also look at qualitative evidence. We have information about deliberation with these movements. Right? Um, governments don't do this in secret. They talk pretty openly about how they're going to respond. Now, sometimes they're lying, right? and they're talking to a lot of audiences. So we do see many states say, we'll never negotiate with terrorists, and then they negotiate with terrorists. Uh, but we do have information on the decision to accommodate. So if you recall, when I talked about this idea of assessing efficacy through uh, accommodation, uh, and we saw this large percentage uh, or non-trivial percentage of instances where you have legislative change or constitutional change, these are not things that are done without public discourse. Right? So we know that there's conversations uh, and decision making that we can look at to see what is the role of nonviolence. Right? How does that affect this decision making? Um, and what is the role of international pressure? Um, and then finally, uh, it's possible to think of a broader examination of success. So here I'm talking about accommodation. I think this is an important substantive question. Um, we want to know why governments respond positively and negatively to these claims. Um, but that's not the only way to think about success. Uh, we could think about uh, organizational survival. So for example, there are lots of organizations in self-determination disputes that do both violence and nonviolence. Often, in the quantitative scholarship on conflict, we attribute the use of violence um, to survival instinct. Right? This is at heart the outbidding mechanism in conflict studies, that you're using violence to gain supporters. Um, that's not uh, a fully supported assertion. Uh, and one of the things that both surprised and puzzled me as I worked on this project is that we see these same organizations that we think might be outbidding engaging in nonviolent direct action. Right? So organizations like the Tamil Tigers, right? uh, very brutal to, uh, to their foes and to their supporters, um, also organize nonviolent direct action. Um, so we do see uh, this real diversity. So we might ask whether or not this is being used for survival. Uh, one of the other things that emerges out of this in the previous project is that these movements are really dynamic in thinking about their organizational structure. So we see organizations essentially absorbing others. Um, do tactics matter in doing that, right? Is it the organizations that use nonviolence um, that are being absorbed by those that use violence, um, or are they able to sustain themselves in conflict? Um, so a number of ways to think about this. This study aims to look at conditions for effective nonviolence. I used to frame this uh, entire project as, does nonviolence work? Um, that makes people's brains explode. They just don't like the idea of thinking about it working or not working. Um, so in, in sort of working through the project and reframing and talking to people, uh, both activists and scholars, uh, I've centered on this question of whether or not and how it can be effective. Uh, and really asking people to think broadly about what efficacy means. Um, in doing that, one of the conclusions of this project that I hope to push forward uh, is a really a rethinking of violent nationalists. So again, look at an example uh, like the Kurds in Turkey. Right? We see an incredible amount of violence both on the state side and on the um, part of the PKK. Um, but there are lots of other political processes going on there as well. Um, I also want people to think about incremental progress and efficacy. Right? Our quantitative studies of whether or not nonviolence work Look at things like regime change, right? huge punctuated changes in the political structure of a state. Um, that's not what happens in politics over self-determination. Right? We do see a lot of accommodation. We don't see a lot of secession. So we have cases like the Berbers in Algeria um, that are relatively nonviolent, and they've gotten incremental concessions over time from the state. The second big uh, takeaway point that I, I would like all of you to take today is to think about these diversity of strategies. 
even though I put violent and nonviolent in the title, so I clearly uh, subject to the same distinction, um, I actually think that's not correct. And I don't think we should be thinking about actors as violent or nonviolent. Um, everyone, every actor has the potential to do both. Um, and under certain conditions, they're sort of likely to do different things. Um, so moving away from this distinction, um, we know organizations use different strategies. Um, not that there are some that are violent, some that are nonviolent, but in fact they're mixing, they're doing both at the same time, they're changing over time. Um, and that these strategies really impact the way we think about them. Uh, so let me stop there. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Yeah.